father who was trying to take an afternoon nap on a Sunday afternoon. But his uh, wife had gone out, and he was responsible for looking after their five-year-old son. He kept trying to find things that would occupy his son long enough for him to have a nap. And uh, he was failing miserably, so he noticed uh, a newspaper out, and there was a globe, all right? Picture the world on uh, the back page. And so he tore that page off, and he ripped it up into about 50 or 60 pieces. And he said, son, this is like a puzzle. And he said, I want you to put the world back together. And he said, wake me up when you finish. He figured it would take his son at least an hour in order to get that accomplished. Well, in about 10 to 12 minutes, the little boy walks over to his dad. Daddy, daddy, wake up. I got it finished. It's all put together. The dad said, you're kidding. How in the world could you have done it that fast? I know you don't know where all the pieces of the world fit. How did you do that? He said, oh, dad, it was easy. He said, on the back side, there was a picture of a person and when I got my person put together, the world looked just fine. When I got the person put together, the world looked just fine. We're going to be starting a new series today, and it's called The Road to Recovery. And this series is going to examine some biblical truths that lead to change and transformation in each of our lives. These are truths that we could call them stepping stones or building blocks in the process. I'm going to throw out a theological term to you. In the process of sanctification. What in the world is that? Well, there, there are two words in biblical theology that sound very, very similar and though you may never remember these particular words, you need to understand the truth behind both of these words. They're essential. The first word is justification. That word simply defined like this, just as if I'd never sinned. And that is essential to being a Christian. In fact, if you have not experienced justification in your life, you are not a Christian. I don't care how many times you've gone to church. I don't care how much money you've given. I don't care how religious or irreligious you have been. You're not a Christian if you have not been justified. Justification is what Jesus did on the cross when by the shedding of his blood and his death, he paid the price for our sinfulness. And justification occurs even if you don't know the term at that moment. I had no idea as a five-year-old boy what justification meant. When they asked me up front at Hume Lake, why did I come forward? I simply said, because I know I've lied and I want to go to heaven. It's all I knew. Being a, a kid at five who had told an untruth, that made me a sinner. I didn't understand at that moment yet that I was a sinner, and that's why I told the lie. And I wanted to go to heaven. And so I invited Jesus Christ to come live with him. At that moment, I was justified. That moment, the payment that Christ paid for my sinfulness covered all that I had ever done or ever would do apart from Jesus Christ. And I was now justified. I was in right standing with God. Without justification, not only am I not a Christian, but I cannot start my journey of sanctification. If you want to simplify sanctification, it's this. It's getting more mature. Do any of you still act like a three-year-old? <laughs> well, I am told if you live long enough, we start regressing the other direction, all right? Um, but no, it wouldn't be very good if at 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 or 80, we're acting like a three-year-old. That means our maturity hasn't stayed consistent with our growth, with our life experiences. And the same thing is true as a Christian. 
Justification is our new birth in Jesus Christ. Sanctification is moving from being a babe in Christ to a, a young person in Christ to being a more mature believer to being very mature. Now, here's the deal. We never stop maturing in this walk with Jesus Christ. So the things we're going to look at over these next few weeks are the stepping stones and the building blocks that move us from that, that entry-level decision that must be made to be justified, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ that takes us to spiritual maturity and onward from there. It's amazing how much better the world around us will look when our life is put together right. And we're going to talk in this series about how to handle and how to overcome the hurts that we experience in our life. We're going to talk about how to handle and overcome the habits that we've developed that are messing up our life. And we're going to be talking some about the hang-ups that cause pain in our life. So quick question. Anybody here never experience a hurt? Anybody here never developed a habit they don't like? Anybody here got a hang up they wish they didn't have? Yep, a pink shirt that won't be hung up in my closet ever, ever again. <laughs> The theme verse of this series is found in the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah, chapter 57, verse 18. If you want to turn there, you may. I'm going to be reading this verse today out of the Good News version of the Bible. Normally, I read out of a New International Version, so mine may read different words, same meaning. I like the phraseology in this. Isaiah happens to be to the right of Psalms. So if you can find the biggest book of the Bible and turn right, you'll find the book of Isaiah, chapter 57, verse 18. God is speaking at this point in this chapter. And God says, I have seen how they acted, but I will heal them. Hmm. In other words, maybe they haven't behaved very well. They've been self-destructive. I've seen how they've behaved. I will heal them. I will lead them. They must be lost. I will provide direction for them. I will help them, and I will comfort those who mourn. I offer peace to all, near and far. This is a great promise of God to his people. May I just point out one thing? I may, may or may not get back to it today, but if you go down three or four verses from verse 18, you will see the scripture says, God has no peace for the wicked. Peace is available to all, but if you choose to stay independent of God, his peace will not be your experience. Notice there are five parts to recovery in this one verse that God would love to do in every one of our lives. Number one, if you have been hurt, God says, I want to heal you. If you've been confused, God says, I want to lead you. God says, if you've ever felt that you were helpless to change anything, I want to help you in your change. If you've ever felt nobody understands your problem and you're in mourning, I want to comfort you. And if you feel anxious and worried and afraid, he says to us, I want to give you peace. Here's a truth that most of you probably know. Life is tough. Life isn't easy. Recently, maybe it's the age group I'm heading into now that I'm Medicare eligible. <laughs> but I'm hearing more and more folks older than me saying, getting old is not for sissies. May I suggest to you, being young in the 21st century is not for sissies either. It's a tough world out there, especially when you have a pink shirt with a small collar hanging in your closet. I I'm going to get over this. I am. You see, we live in an imperfect world. We're hurt by other people. We also hurt ourselves. And then we also get engaged, sometimes knowingly, sometimes unknowingly, in hurting other people. The Bible says the reason for that is found in Romans 3.23 because all, who was left out of the word all? Absolutely nobody. Such you and me all have sinned. That means none of us are perfect. We all make mistakes. We hurt. We hurt others. 
And the intent of this series is to reacquaint some of our church family who uh, knew 11 years ago that we started a ministry called Celebrate Recovery and to introduce an important ministry in our church to those of you who are newer at New Hope. Celebrate Recovery is a ministry many people think is for those people over there. It's for everybody else but me because they have problems and I don't. I've got news for you. There's not a one of you in this room who aren't one of those people, including myself. You see, this series is for everybody. It's for all of the those people who have flaws. We all need recovery unless we've lived a perfect life. Anybody want to stand and say, that's you? Remember, there's a cross there where the only one who was ever perfect got hung for being perfect. But if you haven't lived the perfect life, if you've ever been hurt or if you've ever been the source of somebody else's hurt, if you've ever had a hang-up or a habit and you simply can't seem to get rid of it, I want you to know recovery is available to us all. I'm going to take just a moment and give you a little history about Alcoholics Anonymous and Celebrate Recovery because they are intertwined. It was in 1934 that an alcoholic by the name of Bill Wilson had ruined a promising Wall Street career because of his constant drunkenness. He was introduced to the idea of a spiritual cure by an old drinking buddy whose name was Ebby Thatcher. While in a hospital, Wilson underwent what he believed to be a spiritual experience in his life. He became convinced of the existence of God, and he invited God into his world, and he was able to stop drinking. On a 1935 business trip to Akron, Ohio, Wilson felt the urge in him to drink again. And in an effort to stay sober, he sought another alcoholic for help. Wilson was then introduced to Dr. Bob Smith. Wilson and Smith co-founded what became known as AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, with a word-of-mouth program that would help alcoholics. Smith's last drink on June the 10th, 1935, is considered by members to be the founding date of AA. By 1937, Wilson and Smith determined that they had helped 40 alcoholics get sober. And two years later, with about 100 members, Wilson expanded the program by writing a book entitled Alcoholics Anonymous, which the organization adopted as its name. And the book informally referred to by members as The Big Book. It describes a 12-step program involving admission of powerlessness over alcohol, moral inventory, asking for help from God. In 1941, book sales and membership increased after radio interviews and favorable uh, national magazine articles, particularly one written by Jack Alexander in the Saturday Evening Post, gave AAA great notoriety. But over the years, AA and other groups similar to it, because of a lot of government funding and grants, had to take the name of God out of their materials. And it was replaced with the word higher power. The analogy that often was used is that doorknob could be your higher power. To my knowledge, that doorknob has never helped a living soul. Except to get out of the building. In fact, there are times I've been hurt by a doorknob. I've actually seen doorknobs that would hang up. And so that doorknob is not going to help you. And so as a result of that, Pastor Rick Warren of Saddleback Community Church in Lake Forest, California, developed a program called Celebrate Recovery. It's following the same 12 steps. The difference is he's reconnected it with the emphasis on Jesus Christ and the principles are out of the scripture, which is the original big book. It is the one that has the answers of life and transformation. AA programs often don't refer folks to churches. In fact, they've gotten to a point where they think sometimes churches are harmful rather than good. They believe that church may not be a place of hope and healing, 
what Celebrate Recovery does. You see, in Celebrate Recovery, they talk about the 12-step program. However, they tie it with the eight choices that are based on Jesus' message that opens with the Beatitudes, the great Sermon on the Mount. The good news is this. Regardless of the hurt, habit, or hang-up that you need recovery from, whether it's emotional or financial or relational or spiritual or sexual or whatever it is, regardless of what you need recovery from, the steps to recovery are the same. Let me make this very simple. The steps to recovery are the same. The issue doesn't matter. The Bible deals with the steps to recovery from all issues. And they're found in the Bible. It's the original recovery manual. Let's jump in and look at the eight principles that come out of the Beatitudes. You, you don't need to turn there right now. If you want to, read them on your own. It's found in Matthew chapter 5, and the Beatitudes are listed there. What I'm going to do right now is just take the word recovery, R-E-C-O-V-E-R-Y. There's eight letters in the word recovery. And uh, each letter, all right, it's an acrostic, each letter begins stating what the principles are. And I probably will not say them slow enough for you to write them all down today, but I'll be repeating this over the next few weeks. Also, you can go to Google, Celebrate Recovery, Eight Principles. <laughs> and in your own time, you can write them down, but I'm going to highlight them quickly. Here is uh, principle number one from the Beatitudes. R, realize I'm not God. Come to a point where I admit that I am powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing and that my life is unmanageable. Number two, E, earnestly believe that God exists, that I matter to God and he has the power to help me recover. So realize I'm not God, earnestly believe that God exists, C, in the word recovery, conspicuously, excuse me, consciously consciously choose to commit all my life and my will to Christ's care and control. O, oh, in the word recovery, openly examine and confess my faults to myself, to God, and to someone I trust. V, in recovery, voluntarily submit to any and all changes God wants to make in my life and humbly ask him, to remove my character defects. E, evaluate all my relationships. Offer forgiveness to those who have hurt me. Make amends for harm I've done to others when possible, except when to do so would harm them or others. The second R in the word recovery, reserve a time with God for self-examination, Bible reading and prayer in order to know God and his will for my life and to gain power to follow his direction. And the last letter in recovery is why. Yield myself to God to be used to bring this good news to others, both by my example and by my words. In those eight principles are also found the 12 steps to recovery, and we'll talk about that on another Sunday. What I want to do today, and the remainder of the time we have, is look at the first step. The R in recovery stands for realize. Realize I'm not God, admit I'm powerless to control my tendency to do wrong things, and that my life is unmanageable. Let me ask you a few questions. This will, this will give you some insight to whether you are in need of recovery, all right? Do you ever stay up late at night when you know you need sleep? Do you ever eat or drink more calories than your body needs? I was at men's breakfast yesterday. I saw what some of you ate. Number three, do you ever feel you ought to exercise but you don't? Number four, do you ever know the right thing to do? but you don't do it. Do you ever know something is wrong, but you choose to do it anyway? Do you know you should be unselfish, but you're selfish instead? Do you ever try to control somebody or something and found it was uncontrollable? If your answer is yes to any one of those questions, Welcome to the human race. And welcome 
to the need for recovery. Number one, the cause of my problem. The Bible has a word for this. The Bible calls that tendency our sin nature. My sin nature gets into all kinds of trouble. I do things that aren't good for me. I do them even when they are self-destructive. And I don't do things that are good for me when I know I need to. I respond the wrong way when somebody hurts me and it increases the hurt rather than lessening it. I react the wrong way to people and I treat them badly and then it backfires when I know it's not even going to work. I try to fix the problem and often when I try to fix them, they end up worse than when I started. Proverbs 14 says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it ends in death. We will always have this sin nature with us, the desire to do the wrong thing. Even as a Christian, it still resides in us. It will not be gone until we get to heaven. It's one of the reasons we should find great comfort and joy in our loved ones who go to heaven who know Christ, because they no longer have to battle this thing called the sin nature. They don't need recovery anymore. They are now fully, fully recovered. Paul understood this, and that's why he wrote Romans chapter 7. In the middle of Romans chapter 7 is verse 15, and Paul says, I don't understand myself at all. Have you ever been honest enough to say that? I really don't understand me. I didn't mean that you all didn't understand me. I meant that you didn't understand you, and I don't understand me. Paul goes on to say, for I really want to do what's right, but I can't. I do what I don't want to do, but what I hate. I know perfectly well that I'm doing is wrong, but I can't help myself. It's sin inside of me that's stronger than I am, that makes me do these evil things. Does this sound vaguely familiar to struggles you've ever had? I end up doing what I don't want to do, and I end up in doo-doo? That's the Tim Rowland version of that verse, all right? The first step to recovery is we must understand the cause of the problem. Why does this happen in my life? And the beatitude gives us the, this direction. Happy, joyful, contented are those who know they are spiritually poor. Until we can admit our spiritual bankruptcy apart from God, we need to understand this is the cause. And then the consequences of the problem, and then we need to find out the cure. The cause is sin. What's the cause of this problem? I want to be God. I want to decide what's right and wrong. I don't want anybody telling me what's right or wrong. I want to figure that out for myself. I want to call the shots. I want to make the rules. I want to put myself in the center of the universe. I don't want anybody telling me how to run my life. This attitude is a prime reason that may be next to Amazing Grace being the most popular song sung at funeral services is the reason that the second maybe most requested song is Frank Sinatra's classic song, I Did It My Way. If you won't figure it out in a few minutes, let me just tell you now, I hate that song. <laughs> now, don't misunderstand me. I love listening to him sing it. He sings it beautifully. It's a, but the message of the song is garbage. And I can't tell people that when they tell me planning their funeral service, all right, three days from now, and they want, them, oh, man, that was his favorite song. I can't tell them. Do you realize that song's garbage? <laughs> so we play it. So don't any of you dare ask me to play that at your service if I'm still around, all right? And some of you are saying, Tim, that's a really cool song. Okay, okay, let, let's just break it down briefly. Here's the way the song goes. I wish I could sing it for you. And now the end is near, and so I face the final curtain. What's he talking about? He's about to die. So my friend, I'll say it clear. In other words, I'm going to be really up front with this. I'll state my case of which I'm certain. I've lived a life that's full. I've traveled each and every highway and more. Much more than this, I did it my way. Regrets? I've had a few. Really, only a few? But then again, too, too few to mention. I did what I had to do when I saw it through without exception. I planned each charted course, each careful step along the byway, and more, much more than this, I did it my way. Yes, there were times, I'm sure you knew, 
when I bit off more than I could chew. Starting to get humble. But through it all, when there was doubt, I ate it up and spit it out. I faced it all. I stood tall. I did it all my way. I've loved, I've laughed, and cried. I've had my fill, my sharing of losing. And now, as tears subside, I find it all so amusing to think I did all that. And may I say, not in a shy way. Oh no, oh no, not me. I did it my way. For what is a man? What has he got? If not himself, then he has not. To say the things he truly feels, listen to this next line, and not the words of one who kneels. Have you ever paid attention to that line? That means for every one of us who's ever prayed, he has nothing good to say. The record shows, I took the blows. I did it my way. But it reflects the attitude of our culture. We idolize sitting tall in the saddle and doing it my way, and yet Jesus is the one who said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. You see, that's an attitude that's called playing God. This is man's oldest problem. Even Adam and Eve had the problem. God put them in paradise, and they wanted to control paradise. God said, you can do anything you want in the entire garden, except one thing. Don't eat from this one tree. And what did they do? They made a beeline for that tree. The only thing in, in, in the garden that God said was off limits, and Satan said, eat, and you'll be like God. It's been the problem from the very start. I want to be God. I want to call the shots. I want to run my life. Only, do, do you realize there's only one letter difference between run my life and ruin my life? And what's that letter? I. I did it my way. We want to be in control. We want to play God. By denying our humanity and by trying to control everything. We want to be the center of the universe. How do we play, how do we play God? In a, in a couple of different ways. One, we try to control our image. We try to keep tight control over what other people see about us. We don't want them to see the real us. Somebody wrote a book entitled, Why Am I Afraid to Tell You Who I Am? And the answer is, if I tell you who I really am and you don't like it, then that's tough for me because I'm all I got. So we try to hide and control the image. Number, number two, we try to control other people. Parents try to control kids, kids, parents, wives, husbands, husbands, wives. People try to control each other in the office politics. Countries try to control other countries. We use a lot of tools to manipulate. We use guilt to control. We use fear. We use praise. We use silent treatment. We use anger. We use rage. We try to control. Number three, we try to control problems. Our problems and maybe other people's problems too. And we discover the more we try to fix our problems, the worse they often get. And number four, we try to control our pain. Ever thought how much time you spend running from pain, trying to avoid it, deny it, escape it, reduce it, postpone it? Sometimes we try to postpone our pain by eating or by not eating. We try to postpone our pain by getting drunk or smoking or by taking drugs or getting in and out of relationships. We say, man, this next relationship, it really is going to satisfy me and make me significant. And then we get into it and we say, oops, this is not the one. We develop compulsive habits to control our pain. We become abusive and get angry with other people. Pain comes when we realize in our quiet moments we're not God and we can't control. Do you remember the old Saturday Night Live when Chevy Chase was on there and he would come out and say, hey, I'm Chevy Chase and you're not. You and I need to come out on stage and say, I thought I was God, but I'm not. What are the consequences of playing God? Four things will happen probably to all of us when we try to play God. Number one is we'll be consumed with fear. When we try to control everything, we end up afraid. That's what Adam said when God came in the garden looking for him. He said, I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. 
And so we fake it and we pretend and fill our lives with things to try to overcome the fear. We'll also end up frustrated. It's frustrating trying to be the general manager of the universe. Did, did any of you ever take your kids to Chuck E. Cheese? I, I went twice. It was a birthday party and I hated it both times. <laughs> I didn't like the pizza and it was way, way too loud for me. But, but they had a game in there. It was a mallet game. I don't know what it's called. And uh, a head would pop up and you'd smack it. Another one, put it in smack. Whack a mole. Wow. <laughs> Do you ever feel like life is like whack a mole? You just boom, boom. And, and, and we think we're really in control. <laughs> if, if we really are the God of the universe, why didn't we realize all we had to do was unplug the machine? <laughs> but we're not smart. We, we just end up so very, very frustrated. David understood it, and he said, it seems to be a fact of life that when I want to do what is right, I end up doing what is wrong. David understood it. He said, my dishonesty made me miserable and filled my days with frustration. The, the third thing that will happen to us if we pursue this, the consequence is fatigue. It's tiring trying to be God, trying to control everything, pretending we've got it all together. Denial takes a lot of energy from us. David in Psalm 32 said, My strength evaporated like water on a sunny day until I finally admitted all my sin to you and stopped trying to hide them. If you're in a constant state of fatigue, always worn out, ask yourself, what pain am I running from? What problem do I want to face up to that motivates and drives me to work and work so that I'm in a constant state of fatigue? And the fourth thing is failure. When we try to play God, that's one job description we are guaranteed to fail at. Proverbs 28, 13 says, you'll never succeed in life if you try to hide your sins, confess them, and give them up because it will end in failure. Let me wrap up with the cure. The cure from playing God, that's the first step in this road to recovery is to admit our powerlessness. Admitting that I'm not God means I need to recognize three important facts of life. Maturity comes when we recognize these facts. One, that I'm powerless to change my past. It hurt. I still remember it, but all the resentment in the world is not going to change it. I'm powerless to do that. Number two, I must admit that I'm powerless to control others. I try. I like to manipulate. I use all kinds of gimmicks, but it doesn't work. I'm responsible for my actions, not theirs. I can't control other people. And number three, I admit that I'm powerless to cope with my harmful habits, behaviors, and actions. Good intentions are not enough. How many times have you tried and already failed? Willpower is not enough. We need something more than willpower. We need God's presence. We need a source of power beyond ourselves, and it will not be found in a doorknob or religious activity. It'll be found in a relationship with the creator God of the universe. You see, God made us to need him. And when we don't have him, that need will never be filled. The brother of Jesus wrote these words in James 4, 6. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Grace is the power to change. The beatitude says, happy are the ones who recognize they are spiritually poor. Grace is the power that God gives me to make the changes in my life and to make in your life. And for you to recover from hurts and hang-ups and hassles in your life, we all need God's grace. How do you get it? Only one way. He gives it to the humble. The admission that I can't, but he can. I never could, but he always said he would do it. Let me ask you, what has God revealed to you in the last 30 minutes that needs changing in your life? What hurt are you hanging on to? Or what hang-ups got you hung up? What habit have you been trying to ignore? For many of us, this step is the hardest. I'm, I, I'm grateful it's number one because when we get past this one, over the hump, and, and we just admit I have a problem and a need and a hurt, it, but it's hard for many of us to get there. It's, it's so humbling. It, it says I'm not God, and I don't have it all together as I want everybody else to think I do. 
Do you realize if you tell somebody you don't have it all together, they're not going to be surprised? <laughs> they already know it. And God knows it. And honestly, we know it. We just need to admit it. It means being honest and facing a problem we've wanted to ignore for a long, long time. I hope you'll come back over the next few weeks and join me as we look at not all of them, but some of them. And if you need more than what's available on a Sunday morning as we take this, why don't you come on Thursday night? Meal is ready at uh, 5.30. And um, Celebrate Recovery Worship starts at 6.30. They have a small group breakouts at various times. This was started 11 years ago by uh, Eric Olson here at our church. And um, we celebrated the 10th anniversary last year. And um, there's been a change in leadership this year. Uh, Eric said, I've, I've done the best I could do for the time that God's wanted me here. And it's time for next, next leadership. And so the Gordons, who take um, CR behind prison walls, on a weekly basis. They're now doing it also on a weekly basis here at church. And you'll get a chance to meet them in a few weeks. And um, you'll also have an opportunity to hear a few testimonies over the next few weeks of those who've uh, received a great deal of recovery as they've been through Celebrate Recovery. And so trust you'll come back. But as we close in prayer, I hope you've allowed God to be very specific in your heart. There's not a one of us here who doesn't need something that God had to say to us today. And why don't we with humility accept his grace? Let's pray. Our Father, we as believers often think the need for confession is once and done. I'm justified and there's nothing else I ever need to do. And if we ever grow up just a little bit, we discover that this process of spiritual maturity, this theological word called sanctification, is, is an ongoing process. It's like layers of an onion. You just keep peeling back, getting deeper into our lives, those areas of willful independence that we keep away from you, and those hurts that maybe we've buried so deep we didn't even realize they were there. We've camouflaged them so well we forgot we had them. But step by step, year by year, as we become a bit more mature in our walk with you, our dependence upon you becomes greater and greater. There is more and more that we can admit we need to turn loose of. You give us an incredible promise. Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are tired and weary and beaten up by life, and you will give rest to our souls. You never lasso us and pull us in and tie us up and make us rest. You simply offer an invitation. And I trust that there are those who at this very moment are accepting your invitation in one form or another. Some may be saying, Lord Jesus, I did, wow, I didn't know I was going to come here and invite you into my life. But I think that's why I was brought here today. Was to humbly say, God, okay. I'm a sinner, independent from you, and I want a relationship with you. Come live within me, and I want, to start, I want to start from this moment of justification and start becoming mature in you. There are some of us here who we've walked with you 40, 50, 60 years, and yet you've exposed something to us today that, that, that we've missed. Thank you for hearing each of our prayers. Thank you, thank you for fulfilling your promise of grace to a humble heart. In Jesus' name we pray.